It's not a lab today. Numbers 14, 18. The Lord is slow to anger, bounding in love, forgiving sin and rebellion, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. I want to concentrate on that first sentence. I believe we have a choice of where we live in life. I'm not talking about location. Where we live in the spiritual realm. Where am I going to live? Am I going to live in that first sentence, a God who is slow to anger? Well, always he's that way. Abounding in love? Well, always he's that way. Forgiving a sin and rebellion? Always he's that way. But I can't have that unless I choose to accept that, unless I choose to live there in a forgiven relationship with God, which is, prom which is what he promises he will do. I would much rather live there than in the next sentence, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. If I choose to live outside of God, outside of a relationship with him, then I get to live in the second sentence. I get to live in the punishment of the guilty because we're all there. But we can be forgiven in the first sentence or we can live reaping the consequences of our guilt. Live in the first sentence. That's my encouragement. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are such a loving God, slow to anger, a God of forgiveness. And I pray that we take that as our life. Take that as how we live in that relationship with you so that we can be forgiven and we don't have to suffer the consequences of our guilt. Thank you so much for who you are. In your name, amen. All right, chapter 13. Chapter 13, find your books. Open up to chapter 13. 442. I guess the people who are listening to this on video are not going to get to see all of our demonstrations today. They can just imagine them as we talk about the exciting things. Chapter 3. We are going to begin... electromagnetic waves. We just got through studying sound waves. Can you tell me what kind of waves sound waves are? Longitudinal waves, they're longitudinal, they're compressional waves. Any other description you can tell me, what? They must have a medium, correct, which means they are called a, it starts with M as well, what kind of wave? Mechanical wave, they're a mechanical wave. Sound waves are mechanical waves. We mentioned earlier on that light waves must not be mechanical waves. They must not require a medium. How do we know that? Sun's light from space. We wouldn't see any light from the sun if it required a medium to go through, but it doesn't. Light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, part of electromagnetic waves. So let's figure out what electromagnetic waves are. What's the definition for them? A wave that consists of oscillating electric and magnetic fields. It should be easy to remember because of the name. What does oscillating mean? Okay, something oscillates. It's going back and forth. It's kind of like periodic motion. Something is oscillating. I'm going up and down. I'm going back and forth. I'm oscillating. I'm moving between two points. Eh, very similar to periodic motion. So we have oscillating electric and magnetic fields which radiate outward from the source at the speed of light. Probably a better term instead of speed of light would be speed of electromagnetic waves. Light is just one of the electromagnetic waves, but we use the term speed of light. All electromagnetic waves move at that same speed. Light is a form of electromagnetic radiation. Now, as soon as you hear the term radiation, we generally think, uh-oh, going to get cancer. Well, there are types of radiation that can damage living cells, causing cancer, things like that. But something that radiates simply means something that is moving out from. If I have light radiating from the light bulb, it means light is moving out from that light bulb. It is radiating away. Though, when we talk about electromagnetic waves, it does also fit the category of things we call radiation. Light is radiation. Please don't go running to your closet and turn off all the lights and for fear that you're going to get radiated because there is some perfectly good, healthy, must-have radiation and some that's not so good. The electromagnetic spectrum includes more than visible light. 
Now, that's a little bit of an interesting phrase there, visible light. Do you mean there's light that's not visible? Can you name for me any light that's not visible? Ultraviolet is a light. Now, when you think UV light or ultraviolet light, do you think of a color? Black lights you might think of, ultraviolet lights. Well, what you see is actually not ultraviolet, but it's on that violet end. They look kind of purplish, don't they, when you get a, quotes, black light, we call it. Well, ultraviolet is just past where we can see on the electromagnetic spectrum. So you're right, ultraviolet, we cannot see. That's a light that we cannot see. It's non-visible light, I guess. You may debate, well, why do we call it light? Yeah, maybe light really should just refer to what we can actually see. Any other type, ultraviolet, there's one. Infrared is another one. It's just below the red. What do you know about infrared? Anything about it, what it's related to, any ideas? Um, radio controlled things, you might have, you might have uh, infrared transmitter, a remote for a television, maybe an infrared transmitter, anything else? Night vision goggles are generally picking up things in the infrared spectrum. Um, so there are some things that you're very familiar with that deal with infrared stuff. The electromagnetic spectrum, now there on the wall I have this poster, you see it says electromagnetic spectrum. And they go on this left side over here are the long was, extremely low frequency, ELF. And very low frequency, don't you like these names? VLF. So these are low frequencies and they are very long wavelengths. Where does it say the wavelengths of them? Somewhere it says the wavelength. Frequency, oh there we go, here's wavelength right there. Earth's diameter, that's a pretty big length. So here we have some extremely low frequencies that may have a wavelength that's the whole width of the Earth, diameter of the Earth. And so this one rotates around getting higher frequencies and shorter wavelengths. Radio waves, you can see a whole section here. Looking on the board there, radio waves is the first one they pick up. Lambda or wavelength greater than 30 centimeters. Well, we know 30 centimeters, we're talking about like that. So, I mean, that's pretty big. I mean, that's obviously, if we could see the wave, that's big enough for us to see, except we can't see the wave. But anyhow, radio waves. So there's a whole range of these things that we call radio waves, including radio, like you listen to KLRC waves, but also television waves, UHF, VHF. You ever heard of those terms? Not so much anymore because usually it's satellite, but if you've got a TV with Two dials, man, we don't even have dials anymore. We used to have a UHF dial and a VHF dial. Some of you maybe have seen televisions with those. Have them in your home, possibly. Mr. Kabliska grew up with those. <laughs> um, those are um, UHF, ultra high frequency. Where does it say it? Ultra high frequency. VHF, very high frequency. So they were different wavelengths, different frequencies, and different channels on the television were either UHF channels or VHF channels. Then we move into, what's the next one they say? Microwaves. Good, it corresponds. Microwaves. Now obviously, as soon as I say microwaves, I'm talking about electromagnetic waves, but you think of what? That appliance, that oven. You think of a microwave oven, if I say microwave, probably. What does the term micro mean? Small. Now, it is small, but it is not small compared to our very, very small things. In fact, it's actually on the long end of it. Microwaves between 30 centimeters down to one millimeter. I mean, we can even still see one millimeter very easily. So 30 centimeters down to one millimeter, those really aren't very short, very micro. Because if you look at this, we've got a long way to go getting shorter and shorter for these things. But that really is what micro means. It means they are um, small, very small. Notice up here on the far right-hand column, radio waves, AM, FM, radio, television, microwaves, radar. So you're talking about radar, whether it's the cop who's sitting there beside the road and, oh, you're driving a little fast, or it's for weather radar, whatever. Uh, atomic research, aircraft navigation, microwave ovens, 
infrared, IR, infrared is our next one over there. And when they say infrared, the longest ones are about a millimeter down to 700 nanometers. We need to know the power of 10. Back to your book, I think. Don't they say those prefixes there? Or do you remember what it is? Is it negative 9? Double check. See if Matthew is right. Jay Young thinks it's negative 9 too. I agree. Negative 9. So it's a billionth of a meter. Is that right? Million is negative 6. Billion is the next thing. A billionth of a meter. So we are getting fairly short, but still we're, not, we're about halfway through the spectrum. So we've got a little ways to go after that. After the infrared, oh, let's talk about it. Uh, infrared photography, physical therapy. Infrared is heat when you are driving in your car and you have the windows rolled up, glass will block ultraviolet rays from the sun. You will not get sunburned behind glass. So that's probably good news if you sunburn easily and you're driving all day on a sunny day. You're okay. Behind glass, the ultraviolet rays from the sun, which is what causes sunburn and also can begin to cause things like skin cancer, but that's blocked by glass. But the infrared rays are not blocked by glass. They come right on through. Doesn't it feel hot between a glass, behind glass where the sun is shining? If you don't know, you can just go over there and you should, if I lifted that black thing, you would feel the heat pouring in because it's been absorbing that black screen there on all the heat. So that's infrared. We can't see it even though it's coming from the sun. Visible light, here we go, this huge region Look at this region that visible light is, the stuff that we can see, 700 nanometers to 400 nanometers. 300 nanometers is all. That little bit of the difference in wavelengths that we can actually see. So it tells me a couple of things. One thing it tells me is our eyes are extremely sensitive. We'll get to it shortly. The colors are different wavelengths. And how many colors can we see? Oh man, look around the room. I mean, we can distinguish all sorts of different colors. Just look at the clothes we're wearing, all these different colors that we have. Every single one of those colors is just in a 300 nanometer range of difference. So our eyes are incredibly sensitive devices in what they can detect. A difference in wavelength means a difference in color. Ultraviolet. So UV light, so we're just getting a little bit shorter. 400, we ended up with what's visible, and then we start 400 down to just 60 nanometers. Sterilization of medical equipment, identification of fluorescent materials. When you use black light and you want to do this show, you put on a white t-shirt, and it really reflects off of that, doesn't it? It fluoresces, that white fluoresces, or um, shines, essentially, is what it's doing. X-rays, ultraviolet, we have X-rays, you know X-rays in the medical region. X-rays are going to pass right through many parts of your body, but they will not pass through some of the denser parts of your body, such as bones. And so all an X-ray is, is a um, photosensitive film where you are sending radiation light waves through it and where the bone is it blocks them and so it leaves it white unexposed and where it passes through it turns it black you've seen x-rays just black and white is all you're looking at it's all it's doing it's exposing it or not exposing it because something dense has prevented that ray from coming through and that dense thing is the bone so pretty good to know if your bone is broken right Hayden, if your arm is going off at one funny angle or something like that. X-rays. So you didn't need an X-ray for yours. Medical examination, teeth, vital organs, treatment of certain cancers, gamma rays, X-rays, gamma rays down there. Very, very short wavelengths. And when we get shorter wavelengths, we're getting higher and higher frequencies. So they're inversely related to each other. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency is as we go. And study this sometime, because this chart over here, this poster over here, gives you a whole bunch of things. You can fan out from it, and they'll talk about different things that fall in the gamma radiation region. There's a cool x-ray picture of somebody's hand right up there. So you can kind of fan out from these regions and see some of the applications of what goes on. And then past gamma rays, we have this nice little region on this chart. Can you read it? Unknown, it says. 
doesn't mean we have stopped. In fact, I'm suspicious that it doesn't stop with gamma rays, 10 to the negative 15th nanometers. Negative fifth, sorry, nanometers. We are simply getting so small, we don't have equipment that detects that very well. So, does it mean we have stopped? No, I'm sure it doesn't. I'm sure there's stuff out there that we just can't detect, we can't measure. So, you're never going to run out of physics. I think you guys know that. We're not going to have to worry about not knowing what to do. All right, electromagnetic waves vary depending on frequency and wavelength. And you need to make sure you know the speed of light. All electromagnetic waves move at the speed of light. The speed of light, and we use the letter C. You know Einstein's thing. E equals mc squared. That C is the speed of light over there. And this is the speed of light in a vacuum. Now, through air, it's to three significant figures, it's still the same. It's still 3.00. It's a little bit slower through air, but it's still, to three significant figures, the same number. 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Um, there's another number. See if I can remember it. Maybe some of you guys remember it. 186,000 miles per second. I don't know if you've ever heard that term, but that puts it in perspective a little. That's the speed of light in miles. 186,000 miles every second fairly fast. You'd get whiplash. Some other things too, but pretty fast. Wave speed equation. This is an equation that we have seen before. Haven't we learned V equals F times lambda, frequency times wavelength? All we're doing is replacing V velocity with the speed of light because the speed of light is the velocity of all electromagnetic waves. So we know that number. So speed of light will always equal the frequency of the wave times the wavelength of the wave. We're still in hertz, we're still in meters, or we need to convert it to meters. All right, Let's see if I can remember to turn on sound and stand over by the speakers so that these people who aren't here can hear it. Whoa, where'd I go? like this animation because it's animated. In classical electromagnetic wave theory, light is a wave composed of oscillating electric and magnetic fields. These fields are perpendicular to the direction in which the wave moves. Therefore, electromagnetic waves are transverse waves. The electric and magnetic fields are also at right angles to each other. So this is what we believe that electromagnetic waves would look like if we could actually see the parts of it. And you can't see the parts because we're talking about electrical fields. Now, we haven't talked about electricity, but you guys are familiar that we can have positive and negative with electricity. And you can have stronger positive or you could have stronger negatives. Um, so what we are dealing with is that we're going from zero to positive stronger to negative stronger in an electrical field strength. Magnetic fields. Magnetism doesn't have positive and negative. It has what? If you're talking about a magnet. There are two things with a magnet. South pole, north pole. We have north and south poles. So we can have a magnetic field as well that is oscillating or changing. And let me run through it so you can watch that thing go a little bit. And you can see it moving to the right, it's propagation. And you can see these strengthening and weakening fields. In classical electromagnetic wave theory, light is a wave composed of oscillating electric and magnetic fields. These fields are perpendicular to the direction in which the wave... All right, we don't need to do any more of that. As one is strengthening, the other is strengthening. Perpendicular to each other and perpendicular to the motion or the propagation of that wave as it moves forward. Waves can be approximated as rays. When we say ray, we're talking about an arrow moving in the direction. This approach to analyzing waves is called Huygens principle. The idea is, if you look on the left, where we have these little blue dots at the start of the blue arrows, if you think of a pebble dropped in water, it would create these 
circles, concentric circles that just go out, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, light is radiating from a source. It's really radiating spherically when we're in space. If we look at a light bulb or something, it's radiating as a sphere. But if we're talking about a plane surface here, it's moving out in bigger and bigger circles. So that's what these red arcs are. They're just parts of the circle. And if I have light source coming from along this left black line, well, at any moment in time, if I freeze time, and that's what we've done it over here, and drawn a tangent line, so a tangent, it just hits each of those arcs in one point, we get a new wave front for the light that's moving towards us from left to right. And so we could draw one arrow or ray moving from left to right as the direction that the light is moving. Really, light is composed of all these waves expanding all at the same time, but we can simplify it down to just one arrow pointing in the direction that our light is going. And that approach, it's called Huygens' principle. Lines drawn tangent to the crest or trough of a wave are called wave fronts. So that's the wave front as it is approaching us, just like it was a water wave moving from left to right. In the ray approximation, the lines called rays are drawn perpendicular to the wave front. So they didn't draw a ray here really on it. It would be going perpendicular, exactly horizontal, left to right on this. Illuminance decreases as the square of the distance from the source. Illuminance is how bright something is. The rate at which light is emitted from a source is called the luminous flux, is measured in lumens, LM. And let's kind of conceptually understand why, as we get farther away, how bright it is decreases as the square of the distance. So if we look at the light source on the left, and we, from a light source, that light is going to be moving out in a sphere those waves in all directions. Light is going to radiate in all directions. So we're covering the surface of this sphere with the light that comes from that light source. One meter away, I could cut a little window. Let's say this was a ball that was inside. I could cut a little window there and measure how much light was coming, how much energy was coming through that little one centimeter square or whatever it is region, one centimeter square area. Well, if I doubled my distance, go out two meters away, that little one by one square has now increased to a two by two square. So what used to be one square unit, that same light is now covering four square units. So at any one place, it's one fourth as bright because the same amount of light has now spread out to a region that's four times as big. If I tripled my distance from that one meter, I'm now covering nine square units of area. So tripling it three times as much, I'm one-ninth as much light at any region. Let me pull up a little light sensor that we have. We've got so much stuff that we could do in labs, but I've got to try to figure out what we can do in labs. So let's see if I can pull it up on the screen for you. Connect. All right, we are measuring um, lux. I wonder if I change. No, each one of my ranges I've measured in lux. Whoops. Lumens, LM. I've got to look at the conversion between those two. All right, let me pull this one back up. So I have 152 lux. Let's turn on a light so we can get some brightness. And boom, we're bright. Okay, so if we'll see how well we go. If I put this exactly 50 centimeters away, how many lux? You're going to have to approximate. <laughs> and I have to, I know it. Let me see if I can hold it steady, because I have to have it pointed exactly the same spot. Uh, 
<laughs> Boy, that thing really varies, doesn't it? Somewhere 750, 800, we're somewhere in there, aren't we? Now, if I double my distance, so I was about 800, now I'm about what? Maybe I'm about 300. Now, doubling the distance, we're supposed to be about one-fourth as much. What's a fourth of 800? 200. See if you can see it's 200. Well, more or less. <laughs> I put my thumb in front of it so I can block it just a little bit. But you can see that as I go farther away, my brightness is going to decrease. And you know that. Whew, that is bright when I get close and look at it. We'll turn that off. We have lost connection. Oh, I forgot to remove these things on this one. Reflection of light. Reflection, change in direction of an electromagnetic wave at a surface that causes it to move away from the surface. You know what reflection is. It bounces off. Light is bouncing off something. It's reflecting. Sound reflects. An echo comes from sound reflection. If you are speaking and it bounces off a wall and comes back to you, that's a reflection. So change in direction of a wave. It doesn't even have to be electromagnetic to have reflection to it. The texture of a surface affects how it will reflect light. We can have diffuse reflection or specular reflection. In order for me or you to see something, we have to have light that reflects off that object, unless it's a source of light, like this light bulb, and I still have spots in my eyes from looking at that thing. Anything that's not luminous itself, giving off light, in order for us to see it, we have to have light reflecting off of it. So for you to see me, for me to see you, there must be light that bounces off you, reflects off you, and comes back to my eye. And the reflection can either be scattered, diffuse, reflection from rough, textured surfaces, paper, unpolished wood, many, many things are diffuse reflection. Or we can have specular, think of like a spot or a speck, is reflected from a smooth, shiny surface, surface such as a mirror or a water surface. So if I turn off all the lights, Hayden, you want to close that back door? Thank you. I'll let you come sit down before I turn off. I guess we have some lights up here from my projector, so it's not going to get totally black in here. But till your eyes adjust, all of a sudden things were disappearing, right? And in fact, you can't see very well right now. You can see a little bit. Let me cut a little more light in here. One of these buttons. If I had my glasses on, I could actually read it. Mute button. Where, where did you go? Did I find it? No, I didn't find it. <laughs> I have somebody with better eyes. You have to have light reflecting for you to see. So you can see the things are starting to disappear. You know that. You ever been in a pitch dark like a cave or maybe a closet, no light around? Hold your hand up in front. I mean, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because there's no light reflecting off of it. Now, let's look. Where did my little laser pointer go? I'm going to sign. There's a nice mirror sitting right over there on top of that. So you can see as I am shining this laser on the board, can all of you see the red dot? Why can you see the red dot? There is light that reflects off the board that goes to Marco's eye, goes to Hayden's eye, goes to Jason's eye. It is diffuse reflection. It is reflecting off in many different directions. It's spreading out so that it's hitting all of our eyes, coming back to my eyes so I can see it, stuff like that. Let me move this angle just a little bit. I am going to, now you can see the red dot on the file cabinet. I'm going to move it up. You can see the red dot until I hit the mirror. So you can see the red dot right on the frame of the mirror. And then when I hit the mirror, where did the red dot go?
Oh, if you look towards the back door over there by the thermostat, you can see it. Why can't you see it on the mirror? It's hitting the mirror and it's reflecting and it's going over there and hitting that wall. Because the mirror is specular reflection. It's not diffusing it back out in all directions. It just takes that one spot and does a spot reflection of it, and we can't see it till it hits something that is diffuse and spreads it out again. So I can't see it in the mirror. Let me turn it so it comes on the chalkboard right over there. Makes it a little easier. You guys don't have to go backwards. So here my thing is underneath it. On the frame, no problem. Diffuse reflection. But when I hit up here, it's specular reflection, and I can't see it until it hits the board where it's spreading all out. So there's our difference between specular and diffuse reflection. Oh, let's look. I need somebody who can hold Marco. Your job is to stand right up here and push down this button and shine the laser so that we can see it right there. Okay? Now I'm going to move some stuff so I don't ruin it. This is just water. This is just water in a spray bottle. Jay Young, is it water? Well, you're the one who filled it up. All right. Now, ah, what are you seeing? Can you see it? As soon as I put something in the air that it can reflect off of, then you can see it. So, yeah, you know how to break into a bank now, huh? That's how they do it in the movies. They just spread something on it. Thank you, Marco. This powder, but let me ask you this question. What? Smooth, tiny surfaces, mirror, or water surface? Yeah, if it was flat water, like a mirrored surface on a water. You're right. Good question. I have all these little droplets. Since they're spherical, then they will spread out in all direction. Good question, though, to notice that. Remember, there is this narrow, narrow range of visible light to us. This laser happens to be visible light. Otherwise, we couldn't see the thing. I mean, what good does it do if I can't see it when I push the button? Is there radiation that can be outside of that visible? You bet. So my alarm system does not have a little laser thing that when I break it, it trips the alarm with visible light. No, I'm just shining infrared light or something. So you throw all your powder on it all you want. You can't see it anyway because it's outside of your visible region for your eye. But as soon as you walk past it, oh, it knows that you just got in the way. So, I mean, the movies are great, but really it's very, very easy to defeat that little, oh, just change the light so you can't see it anyway and it will still sit, trip your alarm. Angle of incidence. We need to talk about, oh, we've got to have a picture. Look in your book. We'll probably come up just a little bit with a picture. But look in your book, bottom of page 447. They have this nice illustration of diffuse reflection on the left where it spreads out, specular reflection on the right, and then turn to the top of 448. Angle of incidence. When I have a surface and draw a perpendicular line to that surface, called a normal, we've used that term, a perpendicular. A perpendicular line, when I shine my light down at an angle, the angle of incidence is between that perpendicular and where my light is coming in. I'm not measuring to the surface of my mirror or the surface of where I'm reflecting. I'm measuring to the normal. So here's my normal, and when I'm coming in, I'm measuring this angle here to the perpendicular. That's my angle of incidence. Angle between a ray that strikes a surface and the line perpendicular to the surface at the point of contact. Angle of reflection is the angle formed by the line perpendicular to the surface and the direction in which the reflected ray moves. So you can see on page 448 there where the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection are. And according to this last line, they should be what? Always equal to each other. In optics, the law of reflection states that the angle of reflection of a ray of light from the surface is equal to the angle of incidence. The angles are measured from the line perpendicular to the surface at the point of reflection, as shown here. 
So let's look at it. I'm going to pause my recording a little bit because they can't see a thing of what we're Flat mirrors. So we had a flat mirror sitting over there on top of the file cabinet. Flat mirrors form virtual images. We are going to learn there are two types of images that can be formed, a virtual image and a real image. Flat mirrors form virtual images. They're the same distance from the mirror surface as the object is. What does that mean? Let me hold this mirror up and I'll walk across in front of you so that hopefully you can see yourself. So everybody in this row, oh, you're writing stuff, but as soon as you're not writing stuff, look at the mirror. Am I holding it where you can see yourself? When they say the virtual image is the same distance as the object is, object distance means how far are you from the mirror? That's object. You're the object. Image is, where does it look like the image, the reflection you're seeing, where does it look like it occurs? And it should, as Luis looks at himself, can you see yourself? Is that better? Okay. You should look like you are the same distance behind the mirror as, you're not supposed to look away, as you really are in front of the mirror. So if I get here, can you guys see yourselves? You should look the same distance behind the mirror as you really are in front of the mirror. So Marco, to you, you're pretty close. You're about a meter behind the mirror. And you're about two meters behind the mirror. I mean, more or less. Three meters behind the mirror. I don't know. As you look at yourself, you guys can comb your hair. We don't have any girls, so it goes real fast. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. All right. <laughs> Virtual images, the image formed, you might have heard that. <laughs> the image formed by rays that appear to come from the image point behind the mirror, but never really do, is called a virtual image. What are they talking about? A virtual image can never be displayed on a physical surface. This middle paragraph, we're going to look at a diagram here and try to figure out what they mean, where they say the rays appear to come from the image point, but the image is behind the mirror. So there really isn't light that's coming behind the mirror. When you look at yourself in the mirror, you see your image back there behind the mirror. Well, there's really not light coming from some image back there that's going to your eye. The light is simply reflecting off your face, hitting this mirror and coming back to your eye. That's the idea of what they are saying. So now let's analyze it a minute. You can see a picture of a pencil and a flat mirror, and then there's the image of the pencil. So when we say a virtual image, it doesn't mean we can't see it. We obviously can see it. You've heard the term virtual reality. Virtual reality, it's not really reality. Well, you can see stuff, but it's not really there. You know that. There's not a second pencil back there. So here's our object on the left. The blue right here in the middle, that's supposed to be the mirror. So the mirror surface is this black line. You can see mirror written on the bottom. So when I have H, that's the height of my original object right over here. What we do is we draw ray diagrams. If I took light that reflected off the tip of this pencil and drew a line exactly horizontal, it would hit the mirror and it would reflect back exactly horizontal. And so you can see it's going right to my eye over there. If I drew a different ray coming at an angle, it doesn't matter what angle I draw, but as it's coming at an angle, so here's ray two, when it hits the surface, here's my normal, so my incident angle and my reflected angle, theta prime it's called, are exactly the same, so I know where it would reflect off. Well, this reflected ray, would it hit my eye that's way up there at the top? No, it's not going to hit my eye. But if I follow that ray backwards, so this dashed line, which kind of disappears, if I follow it backwards and I follow this horizontal line backwards, they appear to intersect. That point where they appear to intersect, even though there's not really light back here, but they would appear to intersect at this location, that's the location that the tip of the pencil will form an image. And you could take any point along the pencil and do the same thing with any two light, um, light rays. 
reflect them off the surface using our incident angle equals reflected angle, trace them backwards, and wherever they intersect, that's where that part of the object appears. That's where an image appears. This P that you see, P is the letter we use for object distance. Q is the letter we use for image distance. And the P and the Q on a flat mirror should be equal to each other. How about the heights? H prime is our image height, object height. What is it? Same, exact same. So when you look in a mirror, your head, as Marco admires himself in the mirror here, can you see yourself? All right. His head should look the same in the mirror as it is in real life. Now, let me ask this question. If I have a mirror flat up against the wall right here, and we're going to have a volunteer, so think of who's going to volunteer in a minute. So I look at myself in the mirror, so I can see if I stand, oh, it looks like I have it, I can see the top of my head, and I can see just below my pocket line. I can see right to here. If I walk farther away and keep my mirror st still in the same place, will you see more or less or the same of you? I've got some sames and I have some mores. Who's my volunteer? Real quick, you'll be famous. Thank you, Marco, you're famous. All right, now I'm going to line it up so you'll be able to walk down that aisle right there. So if I hold it, am I about right? Can you see yourself? Okay, and all I want you to do is figure out where on your body the bottom of it is. Okay, yeah, and just keep your hand there. So that's right about the bottom of the mirror. Okay, now walk backwards. <laughs> well, just stop there for a minute. Can you still see yourself? Where's your hand? It's at the same place, isn't it? Go to the end of the row down there. Now, either I've paid Marco off and he's lying. Where is it? Same place. Either I have paid Marco off and he's lying, or when you go farther back, it makes no difference in the amount you can see in the mirror which is correct. As long as your mirror is flat on the wall, it's a flat mirror, it's not curved in any way, and you are just walking straight back. I'll leave it up here. You guys can try it out. It'll take two people. One of you can hold it up. You'll find out whether I paid off Marco or not. So when you have that mirror and you want to see how good your shoes look, but you can't see them, is walking backwards going to help if it's a flat mirror in the wall? No, it's not. Now, if that mirror is tilted, oh, that's a different story then. You're going to be able to see lower then when you do that. But flat, you're not going to see any lower. Comparing real and virtual images. So here's a handsome man tying his tie. When you go to the movies or when your teacher uses an overhead projector, the image that is being projected onto the screen is called a real image. Real images are formed due to the special properties of the lens or mirror used to create them. In the situation shown here, a converging lens bends many different light rays from a point on the tip of the pencil so that they come together at a point in another location. If you place a reflecting surface at that location, you will see an image of the tip of the pencil. A real image forms when many rays of light from an object come together at a specific location. Real images are often upside down when compared to the object. Another kind of image is called a virtual image. You are seeing a virtual image anytime you look in the mirror. Unlike real images, virtual images cannot be projected onto a screen. The law of reflection allows you to predict how light rays will travel when they reflect from a mirror. Light rays from here will change direction when they strike the mirror. Because your brain expects light to travel in a straight line from the object to your eye, the light appears to the viewer as if it came from here. Similarly, <laughs> light coming from this point seems like it's coming from here. A virtual image is an image that appears to be at a location from which light does not actually come. These light rays seem to the man as if they came from behind the mirror, but they actually came from in front of it. 
if I put a piece of paper where this virtual image is, would you see on that piece of paper an image of the man or an image of you? Let's try it. I hold up a flat mirror. I'm going to hide my paper. So here we have Leo. Can you see yourself? Okay, Leo is looking there. If I hold up a piece of paper back here, will you see Leo on this piece of paper? No, when I do it that way. It's like, no, you won't. You don't see Leo back here. Now, if I put it in the right spot, let me change it to Marco. Can you see yourself, Marco? Does it appear that you are approximately where this piece of paper is? I don't know if you can tell or not. I'm trying to hold it the same distance behind. But there's no Marco on that piece of paper. It's a virtual image. It appears to be here, but it's not really there. But, and we haven't studied lenses yet, when you have light that actually does uh, that actually does go there and intersect, then you get real images. Right there, you're looking at a real image. You've been looking at it ever since you've looked at a projector. Light rays really are hitting this screen. And so I really have an image. I can put my hand in front of it and project that image on my hand. Light rays are really hitting there. So anytime I have light rays that are really hitting, it's a real image and it can be projected on a screen. If it's not a real image like this flat mirror, I can't project it on a screen. We call it a virtual image. Let's go back to, I think I have something back here to look at. Oh, I did a couple of problems. You can look them up. Since speed of light equals frequency times wavelength, and we can figure out different wavelengths of some objects. But let me look at this right here so we can get our power of 10 conversion done correctly. It says the middle of the visible spectrum is green light. Calculate the wavelength of green light if the frequency happens to be 5.5 times 10 to the fourth. Okay, frequency. We just want to divide speed of light by frequency, speed of light by frequency, and we get this 5.5 times 10 to the negative seventh. So since I want generally light to be measured in nanometers because it's between, do you remember the two numbers, that visible light? 700 down to 400, a 300 nanometer gap. 700 is the long end down to 400 on the short end, and it's measured in nanometers. So if I have negative seventh meters, then it's nine places to get the nanometers. So negative seven to positive two is how many nanometers there would be. And then if I move that decimal two places to the right, instead of 5.5, I get 550 nanometers. Or you can go through a conversion. But we generally want our light waves to be written in nanometers. So 550 nanometers, right between that 700 and 400 like we expected it to be. So let's look at this one for just a minute since I actually can draw on this one. What they are saying here, I need to go back to stuff that I can see. There we go. What they are saying here is if I draw a light ray one coming straight out from this pencil, it really reflects back, but my eye thinks it's coming straight from the horizontal. <clears throat> if I picked other, any other point, <clears throat> I should change color so you can see when I'm drawing. If I pick another point, if I come down here, law of reflection says, all right, it would have to reflect off like this. Well, if I trace that reflection backwards, so that's all I'm doing here is tracing that reflection backwards, oh, there's a location where it intersects. So where any two rays intersect, apparently in this case, that is where my image forms. If I actually had light rays going there where they intersect, that's where the real image really forms. And so you can do that with any other point on the thing as well. Let's try this. Unfortunately, the other people will not be able to see this, but uh, your book has a prism. So if I have white light <clears throat> and I put a prism and turn it just right, What's the color that you see that's closest to where the white light source was? Red, that you see. It is the visible spectrum, the whole thing, and you see red. What's the next color? Yellow, kind of. If you're close enough, you can even see orange in the, there. After yellow comes 
green. It's hold for me to hard for me to hold it. After green comes kind of a blue and then violet. Anyhow, getting that spectrum to hold out. So what is the prism doing to that white light? It is separating the different wavelengths, and we'll learn why later on, but it's separating the different wavelengths, and every different wavelength I see is going to be a different color that we see. All right, I think that is all to talk about today. So let me stop the recording, and then the exciting stuff will happen.